Thank you. Thanks, Liz. I appreciate the opportunity to be here. And we're talking today about uh, the title is Moving Beyond Research and Commercialization Models Involving Design Firm. And, and so kind of the, I sometimes hate it when people do these initial questions, but I'm going to ask one anyway. So who's, who here is involved in one way or another with, with, with research? And maybe your company is dependent on, on, on the research that comes out of the, the lab, or, or, or you've been a researcher yourself. Uh, a few, I, I would think there'd be a lot of you, but yeah, I, sure. Great. And, and so I've, I've got some experience there, too. I, I'm you know, almost too embarrassed to show these, but um, this was 18 years ago in the, uh, in the uh, basement of the Mechanical Engineering Building. I was working on putting together these, these custom high-speed flywheels made out of carbon fiber that were supposed to store a lot of energy, and then you could harvest the energy later. So I instrumented this up with strain gauges, and there's instrumentation there, and there's a data aggregation computer computer there. And, and so this was an example of, you know, just to kind of show that I've, I've actually been there, done that. Um, 20 years ago, I was doing my master's work. We were working on electromagnetic levitation. And this was all done with uh, Brian Fabian up at, so I'll give him a, some cred up at uh, the Mechanical Engineering Department. Brian's still there. And we were doing, uh, boy, we were doing uh, uh, actual, dif oops, we were doing actual differential equations and matrix form and modeling, system modeling, and actually reducing that to practice and experiments to show that our our uh, 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 controller functions were actually superior and improvements and going to save the world and everything. So um, this this so I, I know this research is is hard and it's and it's yeah, I respect the people doing doing real research. It it is it is fundamentally a, a difficult challenge. Usually has a lot of focus of attention, focus to detail and 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 uh, and as well as ingenuity in how you set up a design of a, of, a, of experiment it really is is a challenge and, and researchers deserve a lot of a lot of credit on the other hand we need to realize that there's a huge gulf between what goes on in the lab picking on myself again with some of the stuff i did and what what actually makes it to market as a commercial or industrial uh, product there is, there is uh, just a, a mountain of, of work that goes on related to, to evaluating what the actual market uh, opportunity is, you know, culling all those, all those market requirements, synthesizing them into something, a rational uh, prototype, and then, and then actually building prototypes to, to test that this might actually work, and then, and then going to production is an even, even bigger bigger challenge. This all requires a network, a team of multidisciplinary folks that can actually work together. So they come from different backgrounds, actually have to work together to, to, to accomplish things like I've shown on, on the right-hand side. Another way to look at it, so these are from our friends at the FDA, and so we do a lot of medical device uh, uh, projects and, and uh, medical device regulating industry. So they've done a lot of thinking about, well, how does how should good product development be done? And uh, not to knock on research, but it's, you know, the, so the, the width of the pyramid kind of represents the organizational, the amount of organizational commitment in terms of dollars and, 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 and people and time that goes into, into a product. And, and research and proof of concept, while super important, it doesn't even, thing doesn't even start if you haven't done that, is kind of the tip of the, tip of the, of, of the pyramid. And as you work down towards to find those requirements and, and, and who's actually using it and then uh, you, you know, the actual design of, of, of the system itself and then the testing is even, you know, oftentimes in medical devices, the testing is a bigger effort than the actual design of the, of, of, of the device. And finally, the manufacturing support is like all in. We're, you know, we're working the entire team trying to bring this thing, transition this thing to a, to a, to a manufacturer who can bring it to market. Huge, huge effort. So this is requiring specialized resources who can, who, who have um, not only specialized skills that they've learned in, 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 in school, but also skills that they've learned uh, in industry. We haven't figured out a way to teach product design yet in any way other than to actually do product design cycles. Um, and, and so we need people that have experience of taking these things through from, from, from start to finish. 
and they have to collaborate. They have to get along, and that's that's not easy. I mean, they could have a whole talk on on that. In fact, I've got a friend who can give that talk, but it's it's about you know making making people feel feel safe in a place that they can they can contribute. And and then you've got these other challenges, which may be bigger or smaller depending on what you're doing in terms of testing regulatory requirements and going to mass production is just is just flat out hard. You just need to realize that. So I'm talking about I've kind of slanted this towards hardware because that's my I'm a mechanical engineer by 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 training. My my interest has always been in building things. Um, I saw Eric Klein of Lemnos Labs recently give a talk about um, uh, give a talk about about hardware and and he was a, he was a hardware uh, workshop recently and I, I so I, I really liked what he was saying I, I so I kind of went and typed some of his uh, stuff from his blog and his website. Lemnos Labs is a is a Bay Area hardware accelerator which means they they put some money into early concepts and then help them help them along. But I love the definition. One, one, tools, machinery, and other devices in the physical world. Two, any technology that involves moving atoms or electrons. And three, something that can't be built by a Ruby coder in a hack week. <laughs> so I, I, I kind of like that one. Because um, we've been such a, a hardware-focused company for 15 years and, and, and laboring, under in, laboring in Seattle, which is a very software-dominated market. So we feel like we're starting to get a little bit of, little bit of credibility now with the emergence of, of hardware as as something real. Uh, Eric asks a good, a, good, a good question or has a good way of, of, of phrasing this, this uh, uh, or, or, or representing why hardware is hard to do. And he asks, take a software company and take a hardware company and look at the first 10 hires you would have to put in place to make them happen. The software company likely is 10 more software engineers to do, that can communicate with you and do, and do the, the developmental work. With a hardware, you know, you kind of can see the punchline here, but the, with a hardware team, sure, you might have a software aspect, you probably do, but you also have mechanical engineers, electrical engineers, firmware, the embedded software guys, the industrial designers, production engineers. It's a whole host of people that have different backgrounds that have to be brought on, on, on board to work and work together and have all this specialized experience. That alone makes, it, makes the stakes higher. So who the heck am I? We, we, Elizabeth kind of gave me an uh, intro, but why can I talk about this? Well, I started this company called Product Creation Studio in 1999. I, I, I was a uh, you know, PhD mechanical engineer. My, my co-founder represents the design side of, of the equation. He's an industrial designer, Cameron Smith. We got together and thought that you know, synthesizing those two things, the, the design and engineering aspects, is what's needed in, in, in product development. So let's do this. We, we can't, couldn't, neither one of us felt like we were equipped to do it on our own. And we've changed the positioning uh, a lot of our company over the years and how we, how we present ourselves. But that design-driven engineering has always been part of what we do. It's really a, 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 a key foundation of what, what we're about. And, and so over the years, we've continued to put people, you know, we've hired people of all over. The, we've got biomechanical engineers, we've got plastics engineers, we've got, we've got electrical engineers and, and, and of, of various, various disciplines, physicists. I think I was telling somebody out there, there's some, a couple of physicists. Um, but we kind of lump people in these various categories of design, uh, mechanical engineering, and, and the electrical engineers, the embedded systems people. And then underlying that is, is, is project management, which can arch across all of them. Our philosophy is, has been to cultivate that top-level talent and in, with, within our, our design team, find things that challenge them, find, find ways, clients that, that have great projects that, that we can put together these project-specific development teams. So that's a key what we do is, and, and what other, I, I don't mean to be just touting my own horn, I mean this to be representative. I, I know of uh, several other design firms in, in the city and, and then many ac across the country that are doing the very similar thing where they put together interdisciplinary teams. Um, but that's what we do at, at PCS where we, we identify a project that needs and put together the right people to address all the, all the aspects of, of the development. So those multiple disciplines under one roof is really an important aspect. So looking at, at kind of the lay of the land as, I, as I've been doing this for, for the last 15 years, uh, these are the type of options as if, if you're if you're a startup company or even a more established company as as you go to select help uh, to help you with with some project or product 
these are the type of things that I see, type of relationships I, I, I see. You know, one is the independent contractor who would be a specialist in some area. Maybe it's an RF specialist, maybe it's a mechanical engineer or a production specialist, and you hire them for their specific help in, in, in what you're doing. Um, potentially their rates are lower because they usually have lower overhead. They're using your overhead. They're coming and working with your team. Uh, the next one I want to jump to, kind of jump over design firms for, for now and go to um, what I would call these manufacturers, which are could be original original design manufacturers or contract manufacturers that have a design team in-house. These are guys like uh, PCH down the Bay Area, Flextronics you maybe have heard of, um, that, that do, do, they do actually do some contract design, but it's all with the intent of getting that into their, into their manufacturing uh, system. They make their money on manufacturing and, 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 and delivering actual goods. And so keep that in mind when, when you're looking at that as an, as an option. And then finally, I want to talk about the design firms. And there's, there's here's some of our competitors right here, um, just giving some equal opportunity. Carbon Design, Stratos are local. IDEO's big, a big daddy down in, down in the Bay Area that's kind of the grandfather of, 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 of design firms. And Frog's a very well-known uh, design company as well. And these guys usually have a broader set of capabilities than the, than the, than the, than the independents. We're, you know, we've got a team of 26 at, at PCS right now, and, and, and they cover a wide range of, 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 at, of capabilities and, and backgrounds. And then we also, we get hired and we represent your, your development needs. We're not tied to any one particular manufacturer, so that's another differentiator. Uh, we'll go through this pretty quick, but this is another borrowed from the FDA. I like, I like some, steal some of their stuff. Um, since pay for it with tax dollars, right? But um, the, the, the kind of this wheel of, of, of development of life cycle of a, of, of, a, of a medical device. And, you know, you can start a concept and go prototype clinic, preclinical, clinical, manufacturing, marketing, commercial use, obsolescence, all the, you know, round and round. And, and you know, I, I show this just, there, there are a bunch of places. You could take any place around this wheel and fit in fit in services, outside services vendors that and probably even more, you can have your tax, taxes done and your, 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 you know, your business strategy and all that. But, you know, so, so, so you need to kind of know what stage you're in and what phase you're in and, and use that to help target the type of, of firm that you're going to want to work with. Because every firm is going to have a different makeup, a different focus. At PCS, we're real focused on that, that stuff between concept and, 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 and clinical. Um, and in, I mean, concept into manufacturing, even. So, I'd put some money up here to maybe wake people up halfway through the the uh, the, the, the talk. Hopefully, uh, stacks of money will 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 give you you know draw your attention. But and, and I, I assume the you know the pessimists in the group are looking at that going, oh, that's the money we're gonna have to pay this design firm to you know to, to get anything done. Uh, and hopefully, the more the realists you know, we'll, we'll realize that that's, that's the stacks of money that you're going to make when you hire this great design firm because you're going to have a, a, a better product and a better, uh, you know, be, better outcome. So I've kind of taken the, you've kind of already addressed this a little bit, but why, why would you contract in the first place? You know, the, and the obvious reason why is resources. You know, you've got a limit between of time, talent, and ability within your organization, especially if you're a startup of two guys or, or two, you know, two to four people that's trying to get something off the ground. You can do a lot. You can work weekends. You can work, you know, the 12, 16-hour days and be caffeinated, over-caffeinated and all that. But you will hit, you, you, you have real limits in what, in what you can do, either, you know, e either with your time or, or your, your ability to do certain aspects of, of the development process. And that's where, you know, these three things that I've kind of gone over already, but, the, you know, you're going to want to look at, People would have extra experience that have specialization in certain areas, and 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 that, and and that have you know you want to find a team that's aggregated talent for you, and that aggregation of talent is essentially, you know, half of my job is about finding great people and fitting them in to to a system where we can we can help people get products designed, and so I go around. This is not even I think this is 20 folks. We've actually grown since this, but but. It, it, there's, there's, there, there, the idea is these design firms aggregate talent, and so it's, you don't have to go find it and hire it. So there's a time savings there. 
there also might be, to hit a little more, there's a key, key area of specialization. If you're doing something related to, I don't know, pipetting, you, it'd be great to find a team that's done pipetting before in automated ways or something, or if you've, you know, looking for, looking for help on putting down a 2.4 gigahertz uh, antenna in your system, it'd be nice to have a group that's done that before and knows the regulatory issues involved and the, and the issues in terms of circuit board layout and all that. So at PCS, you know, we've got some areas that we kind of focus on. Consumer tech, the wireless, wearable space, really hot right now. We've been doing user interfaces. We've been doing low battery, low, low battery, low, low power, uh, battery powered devices for years and years. So we've got some, some knowledge there. We've been doing uh, medical devices for years and, and really working on usability aspects, which that's hot now, the guide, AFDA has guidelines about, uh, about that now, guidance that you, know, you address the usability aspects of your design. Design for manufacturer is, is a big one, and, and, and doing certain mechanisms to position, position things, either cart-based systems or, 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 or therapeutic systems where you're trying to position something accurately is where that's an that's a area where we can help. And then in the industrial world, we deal with a lot of communications protocols, making things talk, getting data from one sensor to another through a, through a network and, and doing instrumentation. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about the types of engagement models that we've dealt with at PCS that I think are, are indicative pretty commonly of, of, of in, you know, in the product design space. Uh, and, and what I see a lot of times, the, the top one is that you know, we love as the, as the product designer uh, firm is, is turnkey where we're essentially stepping in as your full service hardware development team. You know, we've got the industrial designers to help you concept this out, the electrical engineers, mechanical engineers to help help build the, the prototype, build build the concept, and, and the production engineers to help get it to to uh, to, uh, to to manufacturing. And then you know, kind of, we, we, like I said, we become the development team, and we've got some examples of that. Uh, the next step, one that's popular with, with a lot of the med tech, medical device people, is what I call a, a packaging effort, where, you know, maybe they have the electrical, you know, maybe, maybe they have the user interface figured out, or, or they've, got, they've got the underlying um, uh, ultrasound system worked out, but they need to get this thing to, at, from off the workbench to, to a sellable state. And, and that's where our, our design team would come in and look at the aspects of, of packaging that up, what type of housings are going to be used, what metals, plastics, that sort of thing. And then, and then do a design for manufacturer effort with our engineers and help them with production transition, getting, getting parts built and getting uh, systems assembled and tested. And then there's the a la carte, which I'm loath to even, even talk about, or I don't really want to advertise it, but it's that's something that, that, that we can do. As a design firm, we have a lot of specialization. People can, can come in and say, hey, I need a fill in the blank, a tooling expert, I need a plastics expert, I need a, a RF engineer, or I need, a, need a, a, somebody that can write code to make this Bluetooth system actually talk. And, and, and we, we can fill that need on a, you know, just a one-to-one, a, a one-to-one -one, one -one basis. And my warning would be, of course, is that's kind of a gateway drug to other services. <laughs> and, and, and so that's why we we're, are still happy to do those kind of things. So going to some examples now, the, the, uh, this company, Cyber Physical, is a VC-funded company. I'm going to start with a couple of turnkey examples first. And so this was a turnkey. Uh, Cyber Physical is a, a VC-funded startup out of Nashville, and their, their, their product called the Split Second is, you can think of it as OnStar for the aftermarket automotive world where you go buy this thing off the shelf, stick it in the 12-volt uh, uh, receptacle in your car, and now you've got tracking capability and you've got a speakerphone that, that will detect when a crash event happens, actually allow you to talk to a call center and, and, and get help on the way and that, that sort of thing. And, we went through them all the way from the concept of what this thing would even look like. Only thing we knew is that it had to be a separate, uh, you know, independent unit. And, and, and so the entire design of what it was going to look like, how it, how it needed to be shaped to fit into the most, as many of the cars as we could, as, as we could possibly fit. 
and then how we did the crash detection and, and then took them through the regulatory aspects, which when you, you know, getting on a cellular network is actually not a small effort. I think they spent 50, 60, 70 grand in terms of regulatory um, costs getting on the, the uh, T-Mobile network. And then uh, did manufacturing transition. We had engineers going over to China to help get this thing produced and, and, and put together. Renaware is actually a, a funny company, kind of funny company that sells housewares, pots and pans, most of it into the, uh, in, outside the U.S. They wanted to do a, a cool um, uh, water filtration system for areas where the water's really turbid, you know, full of particulates and potentially bad things that you don't want to drink. So they, they brought, we, you know, brought this uh, specialized filtration material to, you know, we're trying to bring that to the market. It actually filters out viruses and bacteria and stuff. But they, in, in this one case, it actually had to sit on top of the, on top of the counter, so it couldn't just be an ugly, ugly uh, fil filtration uh, vessel. We had to actually design it. And so it's got some electronics in there from monitoring uh, usage and tells the user when to refill and all that stuff. And so we did the entire thing from concept, again, from concept to, uh, through, through to production. And again, kind of the last turnkey one I'm going to do is, is uh, the Xeno product. This was done for Avon, and then eventually Amway, Amway took over this line that does that. It's an acne treatment system based on thermal. So there's this little treatment tip that heats up to a temperature that starts to kill the bacteria but doesn't burn the skin. That's, that's kind of the, the their, that's what they say anyway. I don't know. And, and <laughs> if, if uh, you know, the, the, the design inputs here were to really make a low-cost version. So they, this was like their fourth or fifth foray into this, into this, into this market. And, and they um, um, really needed to take cost out. And so our team had to figure out some clever ways of, of automating the assembly process and, and, and reducing the amount of, of, of manufacturing time and the, and the circuit board area as well. So. Now, going on to a, kind of a, a packaging example here is with uh, Advanced Bionics. They're, they're one of the makers of cochlear implants. And this is the Neptune is the first swimmable audio processor on the market for patients who have cochlear implants. This allows, you know, kids to actually go swimming and take a bath without having to go deaf while they, while, while they do. And so very exciting for our team to get to participate in this class three medical device. So it's pretty significant. Uh, le level of concern, and 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 we uh, got to participate with with their engineers who were doing the the electronics and, and embedded firmware. And our team came in, did the usability, the the, the research, the 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 industrial design, the uh, uh, electromechanical integration of everything uh, to make it. Uh, one of the use cases is that they change the battery essentially every day, and it still had to be waterproof. And that's a bit of if you've ever done any waterproofing stuff that's like a nightmare to get a seal that would actually survive that that kind of rigor so Verathon's a local company that that uh, does uh, a variety of ultrasound systems this is a bladder scanner bladder scanner is used well we don't go anywhere. It scans the bladder anyway to <laughs> trust me but it you know we, we did we did an exercise with them where you know again it was like packaging the industrial design the 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 re reworking the, the look of, of, of the device and then doing some fairly difficult engineering because the design they chose had this, had this pop-up screen and, 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 a, and a rechargeable battery back there and yet, yet the whole thing uh, was portable and so you know it's going to be dropped and so it had to be very rugged and very, very sturdy so it was a, it was a very, very challenging, challenging project. But again, this is where our team partnered with their, with their internal staff. To, to, make, to make the packaging part of this go. Liposonics is another a Bothell company that's doing ultrasound body contouring, which, you know, I, trust me, that actually exists, but uh, it, instead of liposonics, you can get the ultrasound version where like the high intensity focused ultrasound actually blows away the fat uh, cells in, in, on the, uh, under the skin. So I don't think the originators of ultrasound here at the UW ever imagined that this would be a use of their technology, but it's pretty, pretty cool. And we, we helped them, again, with the packaging to get ready for, for clinical trials where 
where we went through the, the uh, uh, <coughs> kinematics of, uh, you worked the kinematics of their arm and, and cart, as well as did, you know, some, as some additional add-ons, we did some fluidics work for them for chilling the, the system and, and, and some graphical user interface work. Okay, then to get to the a la carte example, I'm actually going to use a name. I think it's actually out on the wall out there. Joint, joint Metrics is one of the C4C groups, and they, they allowed me to use some of the stuff that we did for them, so thanks to them. So this was uh, Dr. Peter Cavanaugh, Dr. Paul Manor over in orthopedics and sports medicine originated this idea that if we could, if they could monitor post-surgical behavior, um, joint, joint position, and, and I think body attitude as well, using accelerometry, that they could um, correlate good behaviors with bad behaviors and get good outcomes versus, good, versus bad outcomes and actually predict and, and catch people that were not uh, recovering appropriately. The solution that they came up with was essentially what's called a goniometer, a joint um, measuring system that would uh, incorporate a little flex sensor as well as there's a, there's a Bluetooth uh, module in there that, that could then talk to, uh, to an Android uh, smartphone and then transfer that data up. The original system was going to stream that data constantly to the smartphone. The smartphone would then, would then uh, project that out to the, uh, to the cloud and, and, and they'd have all this, this entire data stream real time. So early prototype challenge, when they came to us, they had a, an initial prototype that they'd used to kind of get some, some traction with the idea, but um, it, you know, when they were trying to work on it again, the Bluetooth module didn't actually work, and, and they didn't really know why. So they came to us just asked, can you help us uh, get this thing working? You guys, we know you guys have worked on Bluetooth before. So, the first scope of work was, yes, just diagnose the problem. Is it firmware? Is it circuit? What's going on? Our team was able to, even in the, just in the quoting process, identify like 10 different things that were that spanned both the circuit and the, and the firmware that they should fix and, 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 and resolve. And then we offered them a couple of options for how they might, how they might proceed. And then uh, get, you know, got that small amount of work, and that and that turned into a full full re rework of the of, of the circuit board to resolve all those issues, and and then some additional firmware as some add-on work. So this is the gateway thing I was telling you about. The, as some add-on work, we had got to do mechanical updates because it became evident that their uh, original they didn't have the CAD files for the original work, and and. So we, we just copied what they had and then made a few modifications to help, uh, help it work a little bit better. This was a machine version. Ultimately, we went to a, to a printing process. So all you 3D printing uh, fans, you can be happy. We actually made 25 in sort of a pre-production run of, of printed housings for a, for a medical device. So that's pretty, pretty cool. Did some firmware updates for them as well as, you know, we may end up making a, another out of scope thing was actually making a, a app web application to grab that, grab that data off the, off, off the device. We, we determined it, you know, one of the big worries was, was battery, battery life. And so we identified for them, well, you know, if you, if you, if you don't really need this data real time, we could just log it all on the device. And then when you're done, just send it all up to the, to the smartphone at the end of that, the end of the day. Then both the battery in your smartphone and the battery in the device get a get a real breather breather and can last a lot longer. And so we we did that conversion for them as well. And so wrap up, you know, we went through a, a process with them where we built three functional prototypes, did a series of phased proposals and and and, and ongoing work with them, and then and then ultimately produced about 25 units that were used in clinical trials. So I think that went that went pretty well, and I am actually out of slides right now. So thank yeah. you. Thanks, everybody.